Hello everyone, my name is Gary O'Mealy, and in this video we are going to talk about ligands that have multiple receptors that they bind to. So, so far we've had a couple of videos to really introduce ourselves to the relationship between ligands and the receptors that they bind to. So, what we've seen is that in general, there seems to be a one-to-one -one relationship between ligands and receptors. So, for example, if you talk about insulin, insulin binds to the insulin receptor and in general nothing else. Acetylcholine will bind to an acetylcholine receptor. Epinephrine will bind to an epinephrine receptor. So in general each type of ligand has one particular kind of receptor that it will bind to. So what we can conclude from that is that there's a great deal of specificity between a ligand and its receptor. So it is true that most receptors are only going to have one kind of ligand that they will bind to, but what we're going to see, especially when we start uh, interrogating the nervous system here in a bit, is that these receptors may come in several different varieties or flavors or to be a little bit more proper in our terminology, subtypes. So receptors that have different subtypes, they're all the same kind of receptor, it's just they're slightly different compared to one another, and what's important is that each subtype may produce unique responses. So for example, take a muscarinic receptor, for example. So a muscarinic receptor is a type of acetylcholine receptor, meaning it is a receptor that responds to the ligand acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. So muscarinic receptors, as we've seen before, open metabotropic ion channels in response to the binding of acetylcholine. So we've looked at G-protein coupled receptor signaling before. So the muscarinic receptor is a G-protein coupled receptor. Activation of the G-alpha protein uh, causes this ion channel here to open and the end result is that we open a sodium channel and that sodium flows from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid and that causes the membrane potential of this particular cell to become more positive. But what we're going to see is that muscarinic receptors, again, come in different varieties or subtypes. This particular subtype that we're looking at here opens a sodium channel, which, as I said previously, causes the membrane potential of this cell to become more positive. But let's ask ourselves the question, what if we open, what if we activated a different kind of muscarinic receptor? So if we switch up which kind of muscarinic receptor we activate, we could potentially open a different kind of ion channel. In this particular case, instead of opening a sodium channel, we have opened a potassium channel. Potassium, as you'll recall, has a concentration gradient that is pointed in the opposite direction compared to sodium, so the effect is going to be the opposite as well. So because we are opening a potassium channel, the membrane potential of this particular cell is going to become even more negative than it already was. So what we can conclude from this is that both types of muscarinic receptors that we have talked about are acetylcholine receptors, but because these are different varieties of the same kind of receptor, a single ligand, in this case acetylcholine, can produce two different types of responses at different places in the body. And another thing that you're going to see here very soon is that receptor subtypes tend to be found in different places throughout the body. So as we explore the different subtypes of muscarinic receptors, there are five of them that we seem to know about right now. So you'll notice that M1, M2, M3, M4, and M5 in general seem to be found in different places throughout the body. And what that means is that the release of acetylcholine on these target cells that possess these types of muscarinic receptors are going to produce a variety, wide variety of different effects and responses all throughout the body. 
body. You don't need to know all about these at this point in the semester, but just something for you to kind of chew on, how a single ligand acetylcholine can produce multiple different types of responses all throughout the body just based on what kind of muscarinic receptor that particular cell happens to have in a particular location. Okay, so let's explore the same kind of concept but with a different type of receptor. In this case, let's talk about adrenergic receptors. Adrenergic receptors can bind to both epinephrine, which is a hormone, and or norepinephrine, which is a neurotransmitter. These adrenergic receptors come in two major flavors, each with their own separate subtypes. So we'll just focus on the two major flavors for now. These are alpha receptors and beta receptors. So one of the most common outcomes of activating an adrenergic receptor in the body is that you will get vasodilation and vasoconstriction of arterioles. The smooth muscle layer of these arterial blood vessels have one type of receptor or the other, so they will respond to epinephrine or norepinephrine in this regard. So we actually looked at vasoconstriction and vasodilation in a previous video, so you'll recall that what that process allows the body to do is regulate blood flow. Vasoconstriction is going to reduce blood flow, and vasodilation is going to open up and promote blood flow. So the question here is, what if we did both of these things at the same time, but in different places in the body. Could we, in doing that, increase blood flow in one place in the body while decreasing blood flow in another? So this is actually exactly what happens when you, for example, exercise. So what you're seeing here is a motor neuron that belongs to the autonomic nervous system, which is something that we'll talk about in a future video, so don't worry too much about it for right now. This motor neuron synapses on cells that are located in the adrenal medulla. Your adrenal glands sit right on top of your kidneys. They consist of an outer cortex layer, which we will talk about when we start talking about the endocrine system, and then an inner medulla layer, which is what we're talking about right now. This motor neuron, its axon penetrates the adrenal gland and the axon terminal is synapsing with chromaffin cells that are in the adrenal medulla. These chromaffin cells respond to the acetylcholine that is released from that motor neuron and these chromaffin cells synthesize and secrete epinephrine into the blood. So epinephrine, when you talk about adrenaline, which is the other common name for epinephrine, uh, epinephrine originates from cells in the adrenal medulla, okay? So uh, when we stimulate these chromaffin cells with acetylcholine, they release uh, epinephrine into the bloodstream. What's that epinephrine going to do? So this release of epinephrine is associated with something I'm sure you've heard of before, the fight or flight response, which again is a common outcome of physical exertion, such as if you're exercising, uh, constant stress or perceived danger, such as if you go for a hike in the woods and you come across a grizzly bear. So one of the major strategic goals of the fight or flight response in the body is to increase oxygen rich blood flow to skeletal muscle. Whether you're exercising or running from a grizzly bear, the tissue in your body that needs nutrients and needs oxygen the most is skeletal muscle because you are more than likely going to be using that skeletal muscle quite a bit in order to complete your workout or get away from the grizzly bear. So it stands to reason if that muscle is going to be doing a lot of work, it's going to need a lot of blood, a lot of oxygen, a lot of nutrients. So we need to think of a way to increase blood flow to skeletal muscle as much as we possibly can. So 
the rub though is that if we're going to increase blood flow to skeletal muscle, we have to take blood flow away from some other tissues or organs. So we are actually going to do this at the expense of blood flow to less essential places like the GI tract and the kidneys. So if you're running from a grizzly bear, you don't really need to be digesting any food or filtering the blood to make urine. Okay, so the question then becomes, how are we going to do this? How can one hormone, in this case epinephrine, do all these different things? How can one hormone stimulate vasodilation in one place, meaning skeletal muscle, and vasoconstriction in others, being the kidneys and the GI tract? Okay, so the answer, as I'm sure you have figured out, is that we are going to use two different types of receptors that both respond to epinephrine. So what we have illustrated here, up here, is an arteriole that is delivering blood to skeletal muscle. Down here, we have illustrated arterioles that are delivering blood to the GI tract or the kidneys. It could be either one. So you'll notice that the receptors, and uh, I was a little limited in terms of how I could illustrate this, but to be clear, these receptors that you see here illustrated in blue and purple belong to the smooth muscle layer of this arteriole. Okay, so it's the smooth muscle cells that have these receptors. Okay, so the smooth muscle in the arterioles that feed the skeletal muscle and the smooth muscle in these arterioles that are delivering blood to the GI tract or kidneys, they both have receptors that bind to epinephrine. But as I said, these receptors are slightly different. And because these receptors are slightly different, they are going to produce different responses. Okay? So, if we look down here in the GI tract, these arterial smooth muscle cells have alpha receptors. When epinephrine binds to one of these alpha receptors, this is going to lead to vasoconstriction of these arterioles that are delivering blood to the GI tract. And because this arteriole is vasoconstricted, less blood can get through and less oxygen-rich blood is delivered to the GI tract. On the other hand, when epinephrine binds to a beta receptor, we get vasodilation of this arteriole. So this arteriole is now wide open and blood is rapidly delivered to the skeletal muscle and we therefore are able to nourish the skeletal muscle with more oxygen and more nutrients than we were before, which is good because whatever we're doing to activate this fight or flight response, it's more than likely that this is placing extra demand on the skeletal muscle. So it's good that we have a way like this to ensure that we meet that demand of nutrients and oxygen. Okay, so that's going to do it for that. So here is a list of vocabulary terms you might want to be aware of and for checking your understanding. Number one, which kinds of neurotransmitters or hormones do adrenergic receptors bind to? And what about cholinergic receptors, which we only talked about briefly in this video? Number two, how does every adrenergic receptor produce the same effect? Uh, and if that's not the case, how is that possible? And number three, what role do vasoconstriction and vasodilation play in the fight or flight response? All right, that's going to do it for this video. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comments section. And if not, I will see you next time. So long.